Hello, I'm Nick Gowing and um, I'm speaking from London. Two years ago, my co-author and uh, me, Chris Langdon, and I were invited to give uh, an opening plenary to the forum in that massive tent in that glorious setting of Delphi itself. We'd just driven at speed from Athens through the uh, mountains and we made it on time. It was a glorious day, but our message was sinister. What I'd like to do is update on behalf of Chris and me where we see leadership going at the moment. We presented to a packed hall before the president spoke. His helicopter's noise almost overwhelmed our words at one point. Chris and I started with a blank red screen. It was a screen that color, that kind of red, a red for warning and a red for alert. Then the words thinking the unthinkable were up on the screen. How to prepare for it smoothly and how to prepare for it smartly. Well, over five years, we had identified a sinister trend, um, which is highlighted on the front cover of our book. And there you can see it. These leaders who were blindfolded, troubled that they couldn't see a way forward. And this was before coronavirus. Leaders were struggling and a few were really willing to accept the scale of disruption, which we'd identified and the impact on their work, both then and what was coming their ability to lead and the level of instability they would have to face. We labeled it an end to tranquility. They were all ill-equipped or to even conceive of what was coming, let alone prepare for it. What I want to do is update you. And please, if you have any questions, do send them. If I've got time at the end, I will try and answer as many as, uh, as I can. Our analysis was not speculation. It was based on hard data from hundreds of leaders who uh, between 2014 and 2018 had confided their fears in confidential interviews. We highlighted Russia in Ukraine. We highlighted Brexit. We highlighted Trump nominating him and then being elected and also migration in Europe. We warned that stability was unraveling, as we put it, international agreements, treaties being torn up or disrespected, traditional politics and politicians being stretched beyond their natural stress limits. We urge from leaders of every kind, a culture, a change of culture, a change of mindset and behavior, a new humility, a new respect for the next gen and their existential concerns, especially for the climate emergency, which is now looming for all of us and its impact. One leader warned it was like eating an elephant in one mouthful. Such was the scale of challenges he realized he faced. He was a practical but rare voice in everything we were doing. And I would say our combined reactions, your combined reactions in Delphi that day were pretty cool. They were polite, but for lot top leaders really not really as engaged as they should have been. We could sense disbelief or even reluctance to go there or resistance to what we were saying. It was not about being pessimistic. This was about being realistic for leaders, which is why I'm here two years on. Good leaders don't deny or just palm stuff away. They see reality, they grip it, and they act accordingly. But conformity was and is a huge obstacle as our work has been underlining for a long time. The conformity which qualified leaders for the top by doing the right thing in the right way and not rocking the boat actually disqualified them from seeing the disruption, understanding its scale and nature, then acting in the enlightened way needed to counter conformity, to innovate and transform. And that's what we need now. Often there's a lot of quiet disagreement, agreement, I should say, from those at the top. They quietly sit there nodding as we say that. We highlighted that in think unthinkables could not easily be thought about, of course. More accurate though, with the phrase, thinking the unpalatable, based on evidence which is there, but you don't really want to see it or embrace it because it can't really be that true the unthinkable, the unpalatable. Look where we are today with the pandemic. The evidence and the warnings were there. The political class, the C-suites did not really want to countenance, accept the unthinkable, the unpalatable that scientists warned were, looking, were looming from zoonotics. Top risk registers showed it. The instinct was denial. No, 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 it's not on my watch. Uh, so let's keep going. Let's not spend on measures. It may not happen. Then we will get torn apart by voters or shareholders for unnecessary spending. Let's leave things as they are. Well, at the start of the year, Chris and I urged very clearly 2020 was a time for 2020 vision, a new awareness, a new flexibility, a new breadth, 
a new receptiveness um, for what modifying what leaders do and how they do it at the top. There was little evidence though that leaders really understood and appreciated that this was inevitable. What would test them, their reputation and their customers and voters they served? It was inconceivable. Conformity was still ruling at the start of this year, okay? But then came the medical horrors in mid-January, the widening and deepening horrors in February and the lockdown world for all of us from March. Look at where we are today, all of us, facing warnings of depression, huge levels of unemployment and destitution, but the paradox of huge amounts of cash fueling the stock exchange crisis, leadership being tested beyond anything it ever conceived of, especially because by request and instructions from those at the top, risk registers were too narrow and minds too constricted. How many of you as leaders believe that you would be confronting all that you confront at the moment? Unthinkable? Unpalatable? Let me pause because the leadership implications of COVID-19 have been piled on other huge stress lines which are already building. That stability unraveling, that need for 2020 vision. Let me quote to you what President Macron said at the start of the G7 summit in Biarritz last summer. He said, we are living through a deep crisis of democracy, a crisis of capitalism, and a crisis of inequality. And that was before COVID-19. So we had that deep foreboding in January, February, and March. Would leaders adapt? And if um, I'd been invited by, by Simeon to come and talk to you about two months ago, we'd have been quite gloomy. Obviously, large numbers of leaders, particularly in the corporate world, have been struggling to keep their companies afloat, to keep them liquid, to keep them solvent, just remaining solvent with that cry of cash, 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 to pay the bills, to stay afloat and survive. But for those with cash or political support, we have now witnessed extraordinary changes led from the top with full engagement, engagement at all levels of organizations. It's been really heartening. 10 months or 10 years of change have been achieved in weeks, days or even hours. One top minister from one leading government in the West told me, we have seen five years change in five months as a massive recapitalization of cash, ideas and innovation had no option but to proceed at very high speed. We urged in our earlier work that mavericks should never be written off. They should always be marginalized. They should not be marginalized. They are visionaries after all. The wacky should not be dismissed. They are often wise. But look at what has happened since February, since March. It has been truly extraordinary in a volume and with a scale that no one really could have predicted. And certainly we were skeptical would, would be seen. Experimentation has worked. Fortune has certainly favored the brave, even if the stakes because of COVID-19 and the dreadful medical implications are enormous. But let me take you forward. In other words, we're being positive. We're seeing changes in leadership on, on courage, on humility, on culture, on mindset and behavior, which were being talked about as maybe possible in a year or two or three or four. But look where we are now. Something significant has changed in big ways. But let me take you forward now for where we're going uh, with the enormity of what's coming up. Because what we've seen, and I'm sure I'm stating the obvious, but it's important to add to the mix here. We're seeing a scale of change in leadership, which is suitable now because of what COVID-19 has showed us for what is coming down the track on climate change. Climate change and the urgency of climate change is really the next stage of the massive enormity of the existential threat we've all been facing because of COVID-19. Unfortunately, those of us who are here today, we're still alive, we can talk about it. But others, of course, enormous numbers haven't fared like that. But what we've seen is essentially a dry run, a scaling up for what is likely now with the climate emergency. COVID-19 is not going to go away. So do not talk about post-COVID-19. It's actually going to be something much bigger and could survive much longer. But what we're seeing is a time of difference, a time of change where there's now a massive opportunity. I'm not lobbying here. I'm saying leadership is now beginning to realize that 
Building back better is now the way forward, the greening of the economy, even if quite a lot of leaders are saying that this remains a blip which has to be contended with. No, it's much more than that. There's an enormous opportunity and it's coming down the track at very high speed. Let me quote to you Mark Carney, who's the new, um, the former governor of the Bank of England, who's the new special envoy for climate change and finance. I heard him on a webinar recently talking, this was about a month ago, saying COVID-19 is our metaphor for achieving a lot on the climate change challenge. COVID-19 has shaken the complacency of day-to-day -day politics and leadership. Shaken, shaken there, the complacency. Why did many not take this much more seriously before on climate change and the climate emergency and sustainability? But we are now in a better position than ever. So what I'm trying to urge upon you with this leadership update is to say you may be feeling fragile, vulnerable at the moment. You may have been through terrible survival uh, challenges wherever you're working, whatever you're leading at the moment. But something big is happening. There's a big opportunity which has been underlined by what the European Commission announced a couple of weeks ago, an important moment, a moment they called it, for repair and prepare for the next generation. Uh, the fast forward on the twin green and digital transitions. And I think the challenge from Chris and from me from the, for the Thinking the Unthinkable project is the following that actually this is the way that the kind of changes which we were talking about when we came to Delphi two years ago, the kind of way in which those changes are now going to be implemented, because already there are those who are sh showing it's right to experiment, it's right to be maverick, it's right to be wacky, it's right to think in a different way, and particularly not to think of top down, you as leaders have to know the answer to everything, but to think of it too as bottom up. The next generation and those lower down from you have big ideas, they have new ideas, and they have ideas which are going to run and going to be pop popular and also achieve something quite significant in this new environment. Huge numbers must and can be persuaded to follow you to create a new critical mass now on, on, on recovery. Because as people like Paul Polman, the former um, uh, chief executive of Unilever, are saying very clearly, there's now much more money to be made from the greening of the economy, the tilting of the economy towards green in ways which probably many of you are not naturally thinking about. It is about not just um, the, the removal of the legacy industries and the worries of what's coming down the track, particularly for coal and so on. Here in the United Kingdom, we haven't produced electricity for coal with coal for at least two months now. The economics of all of this are changing quickly. The climate change is threat is now far more challenging existentially than COVID-19. There's really no need for excuses anymore. We have to now overcome the, the obstruction that has made really concerted action so difficult on the climate emergency and sustainability until now. So that is our main message um, for, uh, for this uh, presentation, to really be saying, what kind of challenges are you seeing out there? What kind of challenges are there out there which will bring you extra money, which will bring you new possibilities of developing your business rather than worrying that it's actually going to disappear, that it's going to be, be found to be insolvent. No one wants to say that life is not difficult. I'm just now seeing in my last two minutes, if we have any questions and bear with me, I hope we have one. We speak at length about VUCA world without real consideration about how to lead, manage that in reality. How do you executive education of the future? Well, I don't think it is about executive education. I won't make myself and Chris and I won't make ourselves popular with um, business schools. But we would suggest to you that many business schools and much of the traditional education, executive education, is actually rather conservative, is still conformist. In fact, when we were developing our research over five, six years from 2014, there was enormous resistance to what we were uncovering. One senior industrialist said, you're being unkind to my friends. We were told that really what we were saying was not acceptable by the traditional language of business schools. So when I went to a couple of business schools and gave presentations, there were those who quietly came up to me and said, what you're saying is so important, but we're not really hearing it. So I would suggest to you very strongly that this is about not executive education, but it is about the way you reskill 
and re-energize yourselves within the organizations uh, that you're in, not least because uh, outside in the business world, the business schools and executive education in many ways is conditioned by blinkers. The blinkers which are saying, that's the way we've done it, that's the way we are always going to do it. So think in a different way. And um, I would urge you to read another book or watch, look at another book by Jim Snabe and Mikhail Troller from Dreams and Details. The reason I say that is Jim Snabe, having been co-chief uh, executive of SAP, He's now chairman of Siemens and AP Muller, which is the Maersk giant shipping uh, empire, which is going through a 25% reduction in volume at the moment. That book, Dreams and Details, makes very clear it's the end of the business plan because the business plan actually becomes a hostage at a time of transition and the time when agility and nimbleness are needed. Because in having a business plan, which maybe is, due, is to extend for the next five years, you can't cope with the enormity of change that's underway. Now, this is a big change. I'm sorry, I don't know the name of whoever asked that question, but this is a big change in culture, in mindset and behavior, which really you have to consider. We are pretty convinced that what has happened with COVID-19, what's happened with coronavirus has really shaken people. They now realize it. And I think you've got to be pretty brutal. Um, those on boards and those in C-suites who do not feel comfortable because those who feel comfortable about managing expansion and managing expansion either in the C-suite or the boardroom, are finding it pretty difficult to think in different ways about how to manage consolidation, consolidation of what you've got and e even making it survive. But as you'll see, there are those out there who are now looking for deals, looking for opportunities, who've got cash and are willing to invest now in things which are valued at much lower rates than they were a few months and weeks ago. So don't get stuck on executive education. Easy perhaps for me to say, but we're associating ourselves with now with a number of business schools and those who want to think in a different way. And we would like to inspire you to think in a different way. Hopefully when Delphi Forum now convenes in person, we can come back and share it with you. But this is about a degree of optimism. When three or four months ago, it was rather pessimistic that actually the business community and certainly leaders would not change at the speed that was necessary. Now we have seen that big change. Now we have seen a lot of leaders rise up to it. And certainly for thinking the unthinkable, we want to tell those stories to encourage you, to embolden you, to encourage you that you can adapt, you can survive, and you can then thrive as well, which might seem a little optimistic in this time of real concern and anxiety uh, because of COVID, but we believe it is possible and we've seen examples and our job now is to put that in writing and to share it with you, to encourage you as much as anything else. So thank you very much to the Delphi Forum for inviting us. Uh, we can be contacted if we've got lots of new ideas, which uh, we are putting out on a, on a weekly basis. You can see it at think, um, think all one word, think, um, think dot org. That's where we're publishing on a weekly basis, new ideas, new thoughts from people at the top, including from President Macron, Paul Pullman, uh, and many others as well. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. No other questions. And I finished, I think, just ahead of my time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.